Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this last podcast of 2022, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different than I usually do. I'm going to answer a series of questions that I posed to my viewers early in December. I posted in the community tab of my YouTube channel asking what your earning knitting questions were. And so my plan was to use this video to answer as many of those questions as I could. But shortly after that, I started noticing my social um, media feed was filling up with people posting artificial intelligence art um, and also talking about a new AI chatbot that had just been released. So chatbots have been around for a while, but this was a new uh, release. It was, a, it was one called ChatGPT. So one evening, my husband started typing knitting questions, asking it knitting questions, and then reading them to me. And I said, well, that's, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good answer. And then you type another one, and I'm like, that's a pretty good answer too. I said, well, let, let me ask it a question. And so I asked it a series of questions, some of which it did a pretty good job uh, on. Some of the nuance was off. And in some cases, the answer got worse and worse <laughs> and the further into it it went. But that would be interesting to take some of those questions that people posted and answer them and then ask the same question to the chat bot and see how well it did. The first question is from Katura Spencer, who asks, I'd like to know about how different needle types affect gauge. I'm going to answer that, but first I want you to think about what does needle type mean to you. I can think of sort of three general categories of needle type. Uh, one would be um, whether it's a straight needle versus a double pointed needle versus a circular needle or something like flexi flips. And even for circular needles, there are circular needles that have the standard five inch long tip. So anything, any circular needle that's 20 inches or longer is going to have that sort of standard length tip. Anything shorter than that is going to have a shorter tip. And so the knitting experience is going to be different um, when that tip is shorter. There are also needles called, uh, Addie has a type of needle called flexi flips, which have the double pointed um, part at each end. And then in the middle, it's a little bit of that cable that you would have for a circular needle. So there are a lot of different types of needle in, in that sense. Then another category would be the material that the needles are made from. So it could be wood, bamboo, plastic, um, aluminum, uh, carbonized steel, um, all kinds of things that, that needles could be made out of. And those are going to affect uh, the knitting experience because some of those are going to be slippery and some of them are going to have more drag on them. There's a, a third category, which is, is there something uh, different uh, about the needle shaft or the needle tip? So we tend to think of needle shaft, the needle shaft as being kind of circular, just this uh, tube, uh, circular tube, but they don't have to be. There are some that are square or square-ish that, that aren't round, um, and the tips can really vary. You can have a blunt tip, a very long pointy tip, or something in between. You can also have a tip that has a little ball at the end. So any combination of any of these things um, could potentially change your gauge, but that's the thing. It could change your gauge. So I cannot say, well, if you use bamboo needles, that's going to um, affect your gauge in this way. Um, or if you use a, a nine inch circular needle, it's going to affect your gauge in that way. We don't know. Uh, for example, uh, I've often heard people say that when they knit with bamboo needles, they knit tighter. And I notice that if my gauge is different, it's going to be looser. And the reason it's going to be looser is because the bamboo has more drag on it and it feels like 
when I'm working with metal needles and my stitches are tight and they're not moving along the needle as easily. So when I experience that drag on a bamboo needle, I subconsciously loosen up my knitting. And so my stitches actually end up being larger. It doesn't feel like I'm knitting looser it because I'm adjusting in order for it to feel the same as when I'm working with a metal needle. But there are a lot of people who say that when they work with, with bamboo, their stitches become tighter. The only way that you are going to know how bamboo affects your knitting relative to say, a slippery metal needle is if you do swatches on needles that are the same size uh, using the same yarn and then do your swatches and then compare and see if you notice a difference. Likewise, um, you can see if there's something that you do differently when you are working with double pointed needles or if you're working small circumferences. Some people find that when they're working small circumferences, they just end up knitting tighter. And there's not gonna be a universal reason why that happens. This is the kind of question that only you can answer and then you can apply it to your own knitting and understand what's going to happen if you make a change to a different needle type than what you're normally used to and, and you might notice then that your gauge is affected by that. I asked the chat bot, the same exact question. I kept the wording exactly the same. I'd like to know how different needle types affect gauge. And I'm going to put this up on the screen so um, that you can read it. Or if you're um, knitting away and you're just listening to me, I will read this answer out loud. Gauge is a measure of the density of a knitted fabric. It is determined by the number of stitches and rows in a given area of the fabric, and it is important because it determines the size and fit of a garment. The type of needles you use can affect your gauge in a number of ways. Here are a few factors to consider. Needle size. The size of the needles you use will affect the size of the stitches you create. Larger needles create larger stitches, while smaller needles create smaller stitches. If you switch to a needle size that is larger or smaller than the one specified in the pattern, you may end up with a fabric that is too loose or too tight, which can affect the fit of the garment. That's interesting. I didn't even think about a needle size as being a type. I would also say that you might need to switch to a larger or smaller needle size because if you were a, a tight or loose knitter, the needle size specified may not work for you. Number two, says the chat bot, Needle material, the material of the needles can also affect gauge. Metal needles tend to be slippery, which can make it easier to knit quickly, but can also lead to stitches being too loose. Bamboo or wood needles are less slippery and can help you achieve a more consistent gauge. Uh, that's interesting. I, I have not observed that in my own knitting. Third, the chatbot says needle style. The style of the needles can also affect gauge. Circular needles, for example, have a flexible cord between the needles, which can allow the fabric to stretch slightly as you knit. This can lead to a slightly looser gauge compared to using straight needles. I don't understand that at all. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> I don't agree with it, but it also just doesn't make any sense to me. It's important to note that gauge is not only affected by the needles you use, but also by the yarn you choose and the way you knit. It's a good idea to knit a gauge swatch before starting a project to ensure that you are getting the correct gauge and to make any necessary adjustments before you start knitting the garment. Agree with that as well. I will say I don't usually bother to do a gauge swatch if I'm using a, a needle and yarn combination that I'm familiar with. It just does, I just don't um, bother doing that, but I do do swatches when it's a new type of yarn because sometimes the type of yarn will need a different needle size in order to get a gauge that you are accustomed to getting with that needle size. For example, I use a lot of like three or four ply worsted weight yarns. This is standard smooth plied yarns. But if I use like a chain at construction yarn that's stretchy, that needs a larger needle because it's stretching around the needle. And so uh, when it comes off the needle, it relaxes. And so I'll, oftentimes a chain at yarn will call for a larger needle than you might normally use to get the gauge that they're calling for. Uh, chenille yarns, which are kind of flat and inelastic and fuzzy, 
um, those tend to need a smaller needle than you would normally use to get the same gauge. So sometimes it may not be, um, you may not be experiencing a difference in, in uh, gauge because of the needle, but it might be because of the yarn. The chat bot gave reasonable answers. Uh, they weren't exactly the same as what I gave, but for the most part, it was a reasonable answer. This next question is from Cheryl Wall. Is it possible to convert a pattern from ITR in the round to knitted flat and seamed? I purchased a pattern for a cabled sweater that would benefit from more stability, so I'd rather seam it than add slip stitch crochet to it after the fact. First of all, yes, you can convert something from in the round to flat. Um, for a cabled sweater, it often is, I find, easier to knit flat than it is to knit in the round, but there are, an exception, <laughs> are exceptions, and I will get to that in a second. So frequently, a cabled sweater may have like panels of different cables going across, and the front may be worked exactly the same as the back. Um, up into the arm, the underarms, and then you're going to have to split for the front and the back in order um, to do the shaping for each of those and, and create the armholes. So what isn't clear to me is if this is a top-down sweater that is knit seamlessly, or if this was a bottom-up sweater that was knit seamlessly. Bottom-up sweater, even if it's seamless, is going to have shoulder seams, and that's really where the stability of the garment comes from. That's where um, the entire weight of the sweater hangs from there. And a lot of people will say that, well, seams add structure uh, to it. And the thing is, if, if the side seams are holding up your sweater, and they're not holding up the part in the middle, you're gonna kind of have that clothesline effect. So I, I, I'm not so convinced that side seams are adding structure, but I do tend to knit things flat because I like knitting smaller pieces. The way that you would convert something that has vertical panels like that, that was knit the same in the front and the back, is that you would divide the round in half, and I would add a selvage stitch at the beginning and end of each of, of the front and the back. So, and then I would work that in stockinette. So that will, that will make the seaming easier. Now, when you are binding off for the underarm, if you had been working in the round, they may have something that says, you know, bind off 20 stitches at the underarm, continue around to get the other and bind off 20 stitches. Well, you would of course divide that in half, um, 10 for the front and 10 for the back, but you also have an extra stitch for the selvage, so you'd really have 11 on each half. And then from the underarm up, it's going to essentially be worked exactly the same as if it had been originally worked in the round. So this is all assuming that you're trying to convert something that was knit seamlessly bottom up uh, to something that's knit flat and seamed bottom up. Um, that's not talking about how do you convert um, convert uh, top down to bottom up, none of that. But I do want to show you an example where um, that it can be a little bit trickier. So this is a sweater that I knit a few years ago that has a lot of different cable patterns. And this was designed to be worked in the round and then steeped down the front uh, in order to form the cardigan. And I thought, why on earth would you do that? I want to, to knit flat because I really like the wrong side row rest rows where you just knit your knits and purl your pearls and the cable crossings are always then on the right side. So that would make things easier. So I still intended to knit it in one piece from the front all the way around to the back and go back and forth. Um, so that was my intent. Well, then I started looking a little closer. So the way that this sweater is worked is that there are these sort of horizontal bands that are, I think, 33 rows long. And then they're separated by some uh, rows of garter stitch. And then there might be seven or eight different cables that are worked across the round. So you're not repeating anything. Some of the cables just are worked completely differently from top to bottom and not repeated at all. So you have all of these different cables that are being worked. 
And what I realized is that some of the cables were crossed on odd rows and some of them uneven because you have some traveling cables and the way that things were balanced within the 33 rows, sometimes they were, they were crossing on a, an odd row and some uneven. So if I just converted it to knitting flat, I'd be doing cable crosses on wrong side rows, which would not make my life any easier. And, but because these were 33 rows long and there was some garter stitch, these 33 rows, the right side were odd rows, and uh, on these 33 rows, the, the right side would be an even row because there isn't like an odd number of garter stitch rows that were worked separating them. And so what I ended up doing was rearranging all of these cables. It took quite a bit of time so that I would have odd, odd row crossing cables in one section and then even crossing uh, row cables in another section. So that was a lot of work. I learned a lot from the process. Uh, it was really interesting to me, but it isn't something that I would ne necessarily recommend. Um, and, the, and the reason for switching this to being flat versus in the round was simply so I could avoid sticking a solid color thing that was, you know, a cabled. So the answer is oftentimes you can easily convert something uh, and other times you can, but it's going to be more of a challenge. So I asked the same a question of the chatbot exactly as it was phrased by the person. Is it possible to convert a pattern? She has this cable sweater and she wants to add the seams. Yes, it is possible to convert a pattern for in the round knitting to a flat seamed pattern. This can be a somewhat involved process is you will need to modify the pattern to account for the different construction method and the fact that you will be working back and forth on straight needles rather than a continuous spiral on circular needles. Here are some steps you can follow to convert an in the round pattern to a flat seamed pattern. Determine the number of stitches you will need for each panel. For a sweater, you will typically need four panels, two for the front, one for the back, and one for the sleeves. Hmm. Each panel will be worked back and forth on straight needles, so you will need to determine how many stitches you will need for each panel based on the width of the finished garment. You need two for the front if you're doing a cardigan, but you do need two for the sleeves. Each sleeve needs to have its own piece. Number two, modify the pattern to account for the different construction method. If the pattern includes shaping, such as increases or decreases, you will need to modify the pattern to include these shaping instructions on both the right side and wrong side rows. You may also need to add selvage stitches to the edges of each panel to make seaming easier. So the shaping instructions, that's an interesting thing. Um, typically, when you're knitting flat, you will put the shaping on the right side rows. If you're knitting in the round, you can do your shaping over an odd number of rounds because the right side is always facing you. So uh, typically, if you are going to convert to knitting flat and you did have a shaping situation like that, what I would probably do, like if it said to do shaping every seven rounds, I would do some of them every five rounds and then some every seven rounds. Um, that's typically how this sort of thing is calculated anyway. Number three, work each panel separately following the modified pattern instructions. When you reach the end of a row, turn your work and begin the next row. Seam, it doesn't say anything about converting knits to purls, purls to knits, or anything like that. Number four, seam the panels together when you have completed all four panels. You can use a variety of seaming techniques such as the mattress stitch or the Kitchener stitch to join the panels together. Kitchener is for grafting two sets of live stitches, like horizontal rows together. It's not typically something you would do like for a vertical theme. And then it ends with, it may be helpful to refer to a knitting tutorial or guide for more detailed instructions on converting an in the round pattern to a flat seamed pattern. And that is good advice. So it isn't, I mean, there are a few things in here that are wrong, and it isn't so much that the instructions are wrong, they're just maybe not adequate. Like a lot of questions, I would have some follow-up questions to the person who asked it, like, are you converting top down in the round to bottom up seam? Like, what is it that you are converting? And where is it that you want the seams? Are you just wanting the side seams? Or, you know, there would be some clarifying questions that I would have.
So this question comes from Blue Salamanders. Washing and blocking. Most patterns say to do it, but never what to do. How do you do it? Do all fibers get blocked? Do you need special tools or supplies? I don't have a craft room or anything like that. Suggestions for how to block a large item like a sweater in a small space? At its essence, blocking is applying moisture of some type to the knitted item and then shaping it in some way. So if you are, have made an acrylic sweater that where the yarn label says it's machine wash and dryable, the way you block that is by throwing it in the washer, which will get it wet, and then throwing it in the dryer, which will get it dry, and that's the shape that it, it, it's going to be. Acrylic is, is kind of almost impossible to really uh, force into a particular shape. It's not like wool where you can block it in, into a different shape. It might stay there temporarily and then it's going to uh, return to its original state. So really you need to look at the yarn label and see what it says about washing instructions. And when you have finished your item, you and you in going forward, you're going to be washing it in some way. And so typically for something like wool, you would do what's called wet blocking. And so you would soak it in, in warm or cool water, whatever it is your yarn label says. You can use uh, something like a wool wash. You can use a little bit of shampoo, uh, something like that. Let it soak for a good half hour and then you squeeze the water out. You don't wring it if it's wool. You might roll it up in a, in a towel and stamp on it. I have a, this thing called a spin dryer. Uh, it's like a centrifugal force and I, so I throw it in a, in a sweater, a mesh sweater bag and put it in there and it spins all the water out and then I um, can lay it flat. So actually I just washed two sweaters yesterday. Uh, let me go get the contraptions that I use in order to uh, wash and block those sweaters. So I don't know how well I can show this, but this is, this is what I use for sweaters. It's this mesh thing and there's a little plastic frame and I can lay the sweater on top of it and it allows air to come uh, underneath it. It, they stack. I've got more than one of these and they stack on top of each other. So if you are doing your seasonal washing of sweaters or um, you're just blocking something, but maybe you have some other things you want to block at the same time, you can stack those up and they'll let air circulate and they're portable. So if you don't have enough floor space, you can put them on top of uh, your kitchen table for a while, or you can put them on your bed or something to get them out of the way so that they're not on the floor. Um, in some cases, you actually need to pin things into shape. So if you're going to seam something together, like if you did a sweater in pieces, I do typically uh, wash and block the pieces and pin them to the right shape um, before I seam them together. I just find it's easier to, to seam those edges, especially if it's stockinette and they're curling under, just much easier if the fabric has already been washed and is relaxed. So when I'm pinning pieces out, I have this old quilters ironing thing. It's got a big grid system and so I can lay things out and, and, and pin um, them into the right shape. But I also have a set of these kind of uh, puzzle blocks. A lot of times you'll see these uh, for kids, it's a kid's play mat, you can put them together. It, they function exactly the same. This one's got some kind of fabric on it. It's actually intended for, for blocking, but they're foam and so you have little T-pins so you can pin them into these. I have a terrible time getting things lined up without a grid system. So I have this pad that's got grids on it and, and I use that. But this is the kind of thing where you can just put together whatever size you need for any particular component and, um, and you don't have to um, have everything laid out on a big piece of floor if you don't have room. But once it's completed, that mesh drying rack works really well. For things like uh, hats, uh, I have a, a styrofoam wig form I got from a beauty supply. A lot of times it's kind of smaller than an actual head, so I can put the, the hat on there. But if I'm doing a kid's hat, I take a balloon and I blow it up inside the hat. I don't want the hat to stretch, but I just want the hat to be able to rest on there so it doesn't get fold lines. And then I just stick that on top of a, like a coffee mug or something, and so it can dry all the way around. So you don't need a lot of equipment. You do need... So, um, some T-pins sometimes if you are going to be 
uh, blocking pieces before seaming. But really, you just need something to lay it on, and it's helpful um, if you have a ruler or something, if you want to get things so that they're going to be straight and measured, that will really help as well. But you don't really need a lot of fancy equipment um, at all to, in order to wash and block items. Washing and blocking are important steps in the process of finishing a knitted garment. Here's how you can do it. Number one, wash the garment according to the care instructions for the yarn you use. This may involve using cold water and a gentle detergent. If you're not sure how to care for the yarn, you can test a small swatch and see how it reacts to washing. Number two, once the garment is clean, lay it flat on a clean surface and smooth it out to its finished shape. Number three, if you're using synthetic yarn, you may be able to steam block the garment. To do this, use a steamer or hold the garment over a pot of boiling water and <laughs> steam it. Be careful not to let the steam come into contact with the yarn as it can cause it to become overly moist and lose its shape. I'm really not sure what's going on with this. So typically with synthetics, you can do something called killing acrylic. So before I was saying like you just left with what you can't really block acrylic is what I said it's going to go into its natural shape you can actually do some blocking like uh, permanent blocking by doing what's called killing the acrylic and you have to make sure that you're not applying too much heat that it melts it and I think that might be what what they're referring to holding the garment over a pot of boiling water i don't know like i have a little hand steamer and i do sometimes uh, steam things but I, I really don't know what that's talking about number four if you're using a natural fiber yarn you'll need to wet block the garment to do this fill a sink or basin with lukewarm water and add a small amount of wool wash or a mild soap submerge the garment in the water and gently press it to remove any excess water I don't, I would say excess air. So like wool takes a good 20 to 30 minutes. You need to soak it because it holds on to air so well. That's what makes it warm when, when it's so wet. And even like some super wash wools, you could wa wash it in the washer. Whatever it says you can do is what you can do in order to wet it. Some super wash uh, y wool yarns might say not to do it, put things in the dryer. Well, you should be able to wash it in the washer according to the instructions. Number five, lay the garment flat on a clean dry surface such as a blocking board or a clean towel. If you don't have a blocking board, you can use a large foam exercise mat or a piece of foam core board covered with a clean towel. Foam board, that's a good idea. But the exercise mat they're talking about, that's those little kind of puzzle pieces. Number six, use blocking pins or T-pins to pin the garment to the blocking surface. Be sure to pin the garment to its finished measurements, taking into account any lace or cable patterns. So, you know, cable patterns typically um, you, you kind of want to pinch the cable so that they'll, they'll rise up and lace patterns typically need aggressive blocking with pins. So you are actually stretching it in order to op really open up the lace. Um, that's if you're doing something like a shawl that's typically knit on needles that are several sizes larger than you would, you would use to knit that same yarn like into a sweater. Lace sweaters typically are not aggressively blocked like that. You want to be careful with wool not to stretch it. You want to almost push it into the correct shape and let it dry into that, into that shape. Number seven, allow the garment to dry completely. This may take several hours or even a day or two, depending on the humidity and the thickness of the garment. That is true. Like here in Minnesota, it's very dry here in the winter. I washed a couple of One's a bulky weight sweater and one was a you know heavily cabled sweater. They were dry and it's been less than 24 hours uh, since I laid them out to dry. It has some ending paragraphs. It's worth noting that not, not all fibers can be blocked. Some fibers such as cotton and linen do not have much memory and will not hold their shape well when blocked. So the chatbot is interpreting the word blocked as meaning stretching and not just shaping. Other fibers such as acrylic do not respond well to moisture and may become misshapen or lose their elasticity when wet block. That doesn't make any sense. As for tools and supplies, you'll need blocking pins or T-pins, a clean surface to block the garment on, and a way to measure the finished measurements of the garment. If you're wet blocking, you'll also need a sink or basin and some wool wash or mild soap. 
If you're steam blocking, you'll need a steamer or pot of boiling water. If you don't have a craft room or a de dedicated blocking space, you can block a large item like a sweater in a small space by laying it flat on a clean surface and using blocking pins or T-pins to pin it in its finished measurements. You may need to move furniture around or find a spot in your home that is out of the way to do this. Alternatively, you can block smaller items such as gloves or hats by pinning them to a foam exercise mat or a piece of foam core board covered with a clean towel. So some of the advice um, that the chatbot gave was pretty good and some of it was like completely baffling uh, to me. So, but it is interesting to, to see uh, how it handles uh, multi-part questions like this. So this last question uh, was from Melinda who said, how to convert a crochet pattern into a knit pattern? That was a question that I, my immediate response was, well, you don't. But then I thought, well, what does she mean by convert? So I asked her, <laughs> I said, define convert. Are you talking about translating the size and shape of something without regard to the stitch pattern? Uh, and she said, well, taking a crochet pattern you like and making it in a knitting pattern. I have a poncho crochet pattern I like, but I want to knit it. I just don't know how to make that change from crochet to knit. So I said again, <laughs> what is it specifically that you want to convert? The size of it, the shape of it, the type of neckline? What is it about that particular poncho that you especially like and that you would want to convert but can't find in an existing knitting pattern? And then she said, I don't know how to take the crochet pattern and simply turn it into a knitted pattern to make the poncho and knit. So I guess convert would be a wrong, the wrong word. I just simply want to make the same poncho into a knitted one, but don't know how to. If the pattern in crochet is 90 rows, do I do the same for knit or add more or less? I'm still learning, so I just don't know how to take the pattern and do it in knit instead of crochet. So finally, at the end, it's like, oh, this is what she means. This is what she's trying to do. She's trying to take an actual crochet pattern and read through the instructions and convert the instructions for doing something in crochet and then do it in knitting instead. That's what she is meaning by converting a pattern for knit and crochet. And she's just a beginning knitting, um, a beginning knitter. So she, she hasn't really quite grasped yet the, the complete difference between crochet and knit. You can make a lot of the same items in crochet and knit. You can make a poncho in crochet. You can make a poncho in knitting. You can make a, a crocheted poncho with cables in it. There are ways to do cables in crochet and you can do a poncho with cables in it in knitting. But what you can't do is a line by line conversion. What you can do is what is the effect of this thing? Like a, the size and shape, is it, is it made with, as a big rectangle that's where two of the edges are then sewn together to make the poncho? Is it worked as two triangles? Like how is, how is it formed? What is the shape of the actual pieces? What are the dimensions? And then what sort of stitch pattern um, are, was being used in crochet and do you want to try to find something that gives a similar effect, a similar look or are you just looking for anything uh, in knitting that would work like whatever is standard, whether it's stockinette or garter stitch or seed stitch, whatever, you know, there's so many stitch patterns uh, to choose from. Um, you know, or is there something that, that a particular element that you really like about the crocheted one, like it has a cool uh, collar that flips over and lays, like maybe that's something you want to replicate as well. Um, so, so that's something that you could do. And if she's a beginning knitter, it's probably easier and a better idea for her to look through knitting patterns for ponchos and see if there's something that she likes. Um, but this, this direct uh, conversion process is not uh, possible. So for the chat bot, I was trying to figure out what exactly 
what information to feed the chat bot because the chat bot and I would not be having this same conversation. So what I did was take the second question that she had, which was, how do I take a crochet pattern I like and make it in knitting? I have a poncho crochet pattern I like, but I want to knit it. I just don't know how to make that change from crochet to knit. And that's what I gave to the chat bot. And what the chat bot said was, converting a crochet pattern to knitting can be a bit of a challenge as the two crafts use different techniques and have different underlying structures. However, it is possible to convert a crochet pattern to knitting if you are familiar with both crafts and are willing to put in a little bit of extra effort. Here are some tips to help get you started. Number one, determine the stitch equivalent. One of the first things you'll need to do is determine the equivalent knitting stitch for each crochet stitch used in the pattern. This will help you understand how the pattern should be constructed in knitting. So that was what I was talking about was like you could, if you had cables, well you could maybe do a cable in each of them or something that looks similar. Number two, make adjustments for gauge. Knitting and crochet patterns often have different gauges, which means that the same number of stitches and rows may not produce the same size fabric in both crafts. You may need to make adjustments to the number of stitches and rows you work to achieve the same size as the original pattern. And this is kind of what she was getting at, which she's like, well, if it says 90 rows, do I do more or less than that? And I kept saying, well, it depends on what size you want. And what I didn't say was you use your gauge and you multiply your gauge by the number of inches you want in whatever stitch pattern you're using. And that's what's going to fill up the same amount of space. Number three, consider the drape and texture of the fabric. The way that crochet and knitting fabrics drape and feel can be quite different. So you may need to make adjustments to the pattern to account for these differences. For example, you may need to use a different yarn weight or needle size to achieve the desired drape or texture. Number four, work a swatch and make adjustments. As with any knitting project, it's important to work a gauge swatch before you start the project. This will help you determine if the pattern is working up correctly and if any adjustments need to be made. Number five, be patient and don't be afraid to make mistakes. Converting a crochet pattern to knitting can be a bit of a trial and error process, so be patient and don't be afraid to make mistakes. With a little bit of practice and perseverance, you'll be able to create a beautiful knitted version of your favorite crochet pattern. So that's a very encouraging chat bot. This experience with ChatGBT was really interesting. There were times when the chat bot provided information I hadn't thought to give in my answer, but there were also times when the chat bot gave what I would consider to be an incomplete answer, and in some cases the information was simply wrong. As a master knitter, I could see using ChatGPT as a way of doing an initial outline of a fairly large topic that I might want to present. I could potentially see areas of discussion that I might not have thought of, uh, but I would also recognize areas that don't fit into the scope of what I would want to cover or areas where I just disagreed. I'm curious about what you guys thought of its answers. Would you trust it to answer your knitting questions or would you still prefer to ask fellow knitters or seek out tutorials in books or online? Well, that's it for this year's last episode of Casual Friday. I'll see you next year for season six. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in 2023.